seriously, people, why are we buying toilet paper in bulk? I mean, I know you full-timers aren't because you don't have the room for it, but I don't know why everybody else is either. This isn't even a GI bug. Like, what do they think is gonna happen? <laughs> Look everybody, I'm preventing coronavirus. Hey everybody, welcome back to No Ordinary Path. This is a Real Talk Tuesday travel nurse takeover. My name is John, I'm a travel nurse. Uh, go around the country taking assignments with my family in our 37 foot travel trailer. We have affectionately named Wendy. And actually, we are coming to you from a hotel room tonight because Wendy is in the process of getting fixed with some issues. The topic of tonight is going to be the whole COVID-19 coronavirus thing. So you guys are getting this from an ICU nurse. Uh, travel nurse have been doing this for a long time. I have been through SARS. I have been through H1N1, swine flu. I have also worked with several other very acute respiratory illnesses and injuries like TB and you know all those things flu. Tonight we're going to briefly talk about this, give you some of the most up-to-date stats as of right now, and then I'm going to talk to my healthcare workers, uh, the general public people that aren't healthcare workers. I'm going to specifically speak to travel nurses and then just briefly also for those that are like us that are full-time RVers. There is so much hype about this right now, you guys. It is all over the media, such a hot topic. I feel like I've got some cred, so I wanted to put that out there. I'm probably going to repeat myself. I'm probably going to say things that you have already heard. I may say some things that you might be surprised to hear, and that's what this is about tonight. I wanna to bring you the real stuff from, again, a frontline healthcare worker's perspective. This is, there's gonna be some things here that are, that are, you know, maybe even be surprising for you, but some of it you may have already heard. So let's jump into it. Coronavirus is not new. Um, coronaviruses have been around for a while now. The, uh, we've known about them. We actually have, even have vaccines for a few of them. They even make vaccines for dogs. So I have a very sleepy dog over here on the couch next to me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they've been around for a while and so this is nothing new. COVID-19 is a new strain that you know is, has come out recently out of Wuhan province in China and it went viral. <laughs> so now it's here in the United States. The most recent stats are as follows. So this is as of um, March 9th and it's directly pulled from the CDC website. So it says 432 cases in America, and this is the United States right now, so 432 cases. There have been unfortunately 19 deaths from this so far. 432 cases is a lot, you guys, but honestly, there's probably many, many more actually. And that's the nature of this virus. That's kind of what makes it concerning is because the infection rate spreads so quickly. A lot of these are going to be unconfirmed cases, people that aren't going into the hospitals, people that aren't getting tested and that kind of stuff. From an actual illness perspective, when you look at this virus by itself, it's really not that scary. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a cold, some flu-like symptoms. There are much worse things out there, even homegrown right here in the United States, you guys. If you're wondering, like Google Hantavirus. That's something we have here in the US and uh, it's yeah nasty. So this is a significant threat in some ways and in other ways not so much. The most at-risk people for these are our older population and I'm thinking like 80 plus years of age that have chronic conditions. So like if you're healthy and, and older then you know you're really not of any more of risk than like somebody that's younger. But it's the older adults that have chronic conditions, specifically chronic respiratory problems. So you know if you have emphysema, COPD, you know those kind of problems, then you are at a higher risk for mortality, meaning a higher risk for death. Where it gets kind of interesting is in terms of the hospital overloads. And what I mean by that is right now, we're healthcare system the way it's at is just not really set up for it in terms of like staffing ratios. If you have, you know, 30 people in an ICU, they're all on ventilator supports, then 
they're also staffs short because the nurses and stuff may not be direly ill or needing you know severe ICU level care but they're all still sick and they tell us you know not to go into the hospital while we're sick so they stay home then you have a shorter staff and the hospital's getting more admits and it's just getting busier and busier and busier that's where it you start to see the breakdown as of March 8th right now there are 78 state and local testing sites to run the tests for this virus they're in uh, you know state and local labs within 50 states so every state's got at least one and they have the capacity to run 350 tests per day that sounds like a lot but when you consider the population how many people there are the fact that why why do we not have like 78 that's all the testing sites that we have? Why do we not have hundreds? Why do we not have thousands? I mean, it, it seems silly to me like that we aren't more prepared for this. And that's that's the kicker. Um, you know, we have 432 confirmed cases in the United States. Well, I bet you there's lots of cases lined up after that to get tested. Does it matter in the long run? Not really, because frankly, there's nothing we can do about this. It's all symptom management. You know, I talked about the hospitals being overloaded, but it's not just the hospitals. I know, just in our family perspective, when I'm sick and Kristen's sick, at the same time, it really sucks. And that's what this virus is gonna potentially do to everybody. Think about a business too, not just not just hospitals, what about schools, teachers, other staff, ancillary staff and administrative staff, um, any business, really. Yeah, your employees are gonna get sick, they're gonna go home, they're gonna have two weeks, and then they'll come back, but what happens to the business during those two weeks? And that's kind of, when you think of it at a larger scale in terms of the larger economy, that's why people are kind of freaking out about it. I think that the panic is undeserved, really. Um, like I said, we're, we're not gonna die from this, you guys. We're just gonna get sick for maybe a little while. And in fact, there's probably a lot of you that may just have a very mild cold and can probably work through it. And there's even gonna be some people that are just carriers that get it and they don't ever really even have an immune response. For my non-healthcare related peeps, don't panic. We don't need to panic about this. You're gonna see it, know that you're going to see it. Expect that, but don't panic about it. The CDC does think that this is spread mostly by droplets, meaning coughing or sneezing, and also contact. So if somebody coughs on their hand and then you shake hands with that person, you've probably got it on you. Maybe fist bump or elbow bump or something like that has been suggested now instead of shaking hands with everybody. And you know, a lot of the doors and stuff at businesses and restaurants are all automatic. Use the little handicap thing, hit it with your elbow. Try not to touch all the surfaces of everything. Here's a couple of these things that I told you you may not hear out there. This is from the ICU nurse. You don't need face masks. Please don't go out and buy a bunch of these N95 masks or carpenter masks or any kind of masks if you're healthy. You don't need them. All you're doing if you do that is you're taking it away from the actual healthcare providers or people that are sick that do need them. The CDC even recommends it is not helpful for people that are healthy to wear these things around, okay? Don't wrap yourself in trash bags. You don't need hazmat suits. You don't need like crazy, you know, World War II respirate. Yeah, okay, guys, just wash your hands. Nothing prevents infection more than washing your hands, nothing. So if you are healthy, please don't go buy masks. If you were sick, if you think you have the coronavirus, wear a mask. If you have family members in your house that you think may have the coronavirus or that you know does, wear a mask. This one's really important. If you think you have it and you are sick, do not go to the hospital. And I did say that, let me say it again. If you think you are sick with this, don't go to the hospital. Here's the, here's the deal. This is a viral infection. What that means is that there is no cure. It, we're not gonna give Tamiflu for it. Okay, that, that does not work on it. We know that already. There is nothing we have to treat this thing. It is symptom management only. So the only thing the hospital is gonna do for you is tell you that you need to go home and rest and drink water. That's what they're gonna tell you. Don't go, okay? Now, here's the caveat. If you find yourself 
having significant shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, or if you have high level fevers, like over the 102, 103 range, then go in. Those are the people that are potentially starting to have organ system involvement that are going to need that level of care. If you are just sick and you feel crummy, I'm sorry you guys, don't go to the hospital please. It's going to be full of jokers that shouldn't be there. Don't add to that number. There are going to be people that really do need it and those beds are gonna be short staffed and those beds are gonna be very limited reserved hopefully for the people that actually really are potentially deathly sick over this. So if you're just mildly sick and you feel horrible but you're not like, you know, shortness of breath, dying, don't go to the hospital, please. For my healthcare workers, understand, guys, it's going to get busy at work. <laughs> I don't care if you work in the ICU, you're definitely going to see it there. In the ER, definitely going to see it there too. But you're going to see it on med surge, you're going to see it on tele, you're going to see it on oncology, you may see it in labor and delivery, you're going to see it shoved wherever the hospital can put it. This is going to be one of those scenarios, you guys, where like the hospital's putting in patients like in the PACU, you know, in the IV clinic, they're going to just put patients wherever they can. That's what they're seeing in Washington in California where they are getting larger amounts of people coming in for this kind of stuff. It's just starting to overwhelm already. It's in small pockets right now, but it has potential to get bigger. Maybe it won't, we don't really know, but the potential is there and that's the concern. Here's my big thing for the healthcare workers. CDC recommends PPE for this, protect personal protective equipment, goggles or a face shield, they do recommend N95 or a PAPR, that's the personalized air system, you guys know what that is. Gowns and gloves, you don't need booties or leggies, you don't need to wear a hazmat suit for this, you guys, there's, yeah, you don't need to like wrap yourself in trash bags and yeah. But that PPE is important. If your facility does not have it available for you for either confirmed or suspected cases, somebody should be throwing a fit. I'm sorry, it's a no-go. The N95s are important, PAPRs are important. If they don't have that kind of stuff for you, it's a big deal, make sure that they do. When you go home from the hospital, even if you don't have cases, even if you don't care for super, super sick people, this is just good advice across the board, but especially if you are starting to see this in your facility, having some sort of home decon process is gonna be beneficial. Um, whether it's like what we used to call the porch light system, so I'd say turn the porch light off, I'm on my way home, meaning that I need Kristen to leave a trash bag out on the front porch with the porch light off because I'm going to strip on my front porch and put all my stuff in a trash bag, take it to the laundry and, and do it like right then. Um, don't walk in your house with your shoes, you guys. E either Lysol the crud out of them, use the cabbie wipes, use bleach wipes, whatever. Clean the shoes really well or don't even bring them into the house. Get rid of your scrubs, take them off, all that kind of stuff. There needs to be some sort of decon. You don't want this stuff spreading around. And obviously, guys, foam in, foam out, hand wash. Everybody knows that stuff. Travel nurses. You know, one of the things that I, I'm not gonna say that I like about this, but it is interesting because we are starting to see the media come out with the travel nurses are flocking into Washington and into California to really try to help with this. And they are finally getting seen as the heroes that we've always known them to be. I mean, I know that's sort of tooting my own horn a little bit, but I mean, it is it is the case that it is. There are lots of people and travel nurses going to these places to take these assignments. Yes, there's money involved, we know that. Nevertheless, they're still going there knowing that it's there. So thank you, guys. That being said, please don't be cannon fodder, okay? We know that these are in those places. At the same time, make sure before you go that you know that there's adequate compensation and that that hospital still has adequate PPE for you, okay? Make sure you know those things going into it. Also, I've had several people reach out to me and say, hey, I've got a contract at this hospital where they have known cases that they're even quarantining their nurses. What should I do? Should I take it? Should I not take it? I haven't, you know, I've signed the contract, but I haven't left to go yet. Mm. Tough question. And one I've heard from a few different people now. Here's the thing. You really got to think about it as yourself. Um, you know, I mean, you are going into a potentially risky scenario. Do you have respiratory problems? You know, are you an older adult? If you're still 80 and travel nursing, wow, <laughs> props. But, uh, 
Even if you're not an older adult, but you have like chronic asthma issues, or if you're a smoker, because I know there's still some nurses out there that despite knowing better, still do smoke. You know, if you have any kind of lung problems, don't, just don't guys. You're at too much of a high risk. There will be other people to take these assignments. There will be. Don't put yourself at risk of potentially getting like a major quarantine and stuck at the hospital and who knows, maybe your agency won't cover you. Like don't, 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 just don't. Also, you guys, as travel nurses, check with your agency. Here's the deal. What If I get sick with this, am I gonna be covered? You know, um, are you, what about my stipends? You know, I mean, this is some potentially a significant loss of income for a couple of weeks or maybe even more if I'm really sick. What if you're quarantined in the hospital like some of these other nurses? What, what's my travel agency gonna do? Talk to your travel agency about that. That's important. Here's the deal, guys, because I know some people may ask about it. I have talked with Atlas. Um, I'm sure they're preparing like a public service announcement stuff like most places are. I don't think they've put one out yet, so I'm not going to touch on their stuff. But just know this, for my sake, I am in good hands, as always. Not worried about it. And then finally, full-time RVers. As Kristen and we have our family with us, this is what I have to say about it. First of all, it's a significant issue because we don't have places to store 500 rolls of toilet paper. Seriously, people, why are we buying toilet paper in bulk? I mean, I know you full-timers aren't because you don't have the room for it, but I don't know why everybody else is either. This isn't even a GI bug. Like, what do they think is gonna happen? <laughs> Helpful tips and stuff, just like everything else that I've always said, guys, if you had sticks and bricks, you do the same thing. Disinfect stuff, wipe the counters down, you know, what? Make everybody wash their hands before they eat. All the same stuff you would do normally. Also, if you are wanting to store stuff or you know procure supplies for the zombie apocalypse, you can do so. In fact, we did. And what we did is Kristen went out and she bought a nice sturdy tote. And in there, what we have stocked full of things. Is there any toilet paper in there? Not a, There's not, not a single there are two We are screwed. Kleenex. But we do have Kleenex that can be used in a pinch. Not good for the tank, though. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, what we put in there is stuff for like what would happen if Kristen and I were both sick at the same time, which has happened just with any old illness, right? So it's things like soup. Uh, mac and cheese, you know, like the stuff that you're going to use to cook over the stove when you feel awful and you're standing there in your robe and like sniffling and your slippers and the kids are just randomly running around or hopefully watching whatever on Netflix just to keep them occupied because you don't want to deal with it. That's what it's full of. It's full of Gatorade, canned food, other things that are non-perishable that can sit. And we store that in a tote in the back of Kristen's van. And it's, it's really easy to do. And there's probably about two weeks worth of food in there because that's generally all you're gonna need for this. That's the average time of infection where people feel down and out and then they're starting to feel better. Last point here is I know that there's a lot of crap going around on the media. And I know that some of it is good stuff. And then guys, there's also just some stupid stuff. Don't let fear about this kind of overrule your lives. You don't need to wrap yourself in trash bags. That be educated about it. Go to legitimate sources to get your, you know, your most recent stuff. You know, ask healthcare professionals, ask nurses and doctors and those kind of things. We're still out there living our life. I'm still going to go out to eat. We're still going to go to the restaurants. We were out hiking at Saguaro National Park again today as a family. Like that we don't you don't need to live in fear and duct tape your windows closed and this is not outbreak. That's it. Enough of that. So, thank you guys for tuning in again. I hope you found it informative. If you did, hit the like button, leave comments. I, I would love to discuss this more. I'm curious as to what you guys think about it. Um, yeah, leave comments below, especially my other fellow travel nurses out there. What do you think about going into it? Um, as for me, because uh, that might somebody might bring this up, I'm probably not going to take an assignment in a hot zone area, mainly because I have my family with me. And while there haven't really been any kids that have had any serious complications from this, it's just one of those things is I don't want to have to deal with the whole Kristen and I are sick when the kids are running around destroying the trailer issue. <laughs> That's what it's about more than anything else. So I uh, just stay safe out there, guys. Wash your hands. And uh, yeah, we'll see you out on the road.